Hello and welcome to Corpus Cast, the podcast all about corpus linguistics and what it can do for society. Each episode, we'll explore how the study of language in large corpora is used to tackle challenges in the world relating to education, health and technology, among many others. So, sit back, relax and join us as we discover the ways in which corpus linguistics is shaping the future of the study of language. I'm your host, Robbie Love, and I'm a corpus linguist at Aston University. On today's episode, we're talking about an institution of corpus linguistics, a, a literal institution being the longest established research center for corpus linguistics in Europe, the Survey of English Usage at University College London. To tell me all about the Survey of English Usage, we have its director, Professor Baz Arts, a renowned expert in the field of corpus linguistics and professor of English linguistics at University College London, and a self-professed grammar enthusiast. With a career spanning over three decades, Professor Arts has made significant contributions to our understanding of the English language, from the structure of grammar to the use of idioms and phraseology. He is co-editor of several influential books, including the Oxford Handbook of English Grammar, and the Handbook of English Linguistics, and author of the Oxford Modern English Grammar and the Oxford Dictionary of English Grammar, uh, among many others. And he was also founding editor of the journal English Language and Linguistics. So today we're honored to have Baz with us to tell us all about the survey of English usage. So without any further ado, please welcome Professor Baz Arts. Hello, welcome. Hi, Robbie. How are you? Very well, thank you. How are you? Not too bad. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you for agreeing to come on. It's it's an absolute uh, pleasure to to have you here, and, and thank you so much. Um, we've been uh, going for a little while now with Corpus Cast, and and there are a few questions that I I insist on asking all of my guests. So uh, there's no exception for you. Um, my first question to you to get us started is: What does Corpus linguistics mean to you? Uh, well, probably not unlike many other colleagues, data, 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 um, the data that helped you do your research, uh, and in my case, that's English syntax, uh, solving the puzzles of English syntax using real data as opposed to just introspective data, which theoreticians uh, like to use or used, used to like to use. It's changed a bit because even theoreticians now are much more interested in corpora than they used to be. Um, so for me, it, it, it's that, using uh, using the data and, and seeing corpus linguistics as a methodology for answering uh, uh, research questions in English grammar. And so how did you, you know, get started in corpus linguistics? I, I like to ask this because it's it's not necessarily something that when you're growing up, you, you maybe even know about, and then, uh, you know, certain people end up sort of forging a career using these these tools and methods in their research. So what was it for you that, that first got you interested in, in this set of approaches to the study of language? Um, well, it started with me doing an MA in English Linguistics at UCL and uh, finding out that, that it is actually a center of corpus linguistics. Um, this was at a time when Randolph Quirk, who founded the survey, was still around, but he wasn't the director anymore at that time. Um, I then went back to UCL to do a PhD and um, rolled into corpus linguistics in, in, in that way. So you mentioned uh, Randolph Quirk there, the, the um, founder of the Survey of English Usage. And of course, you are now um, its director and, and have been since the uh, late 1990s, I believe. Yeah. Um, tell us more. Of course, we're, we're interested in, in the survey of English usage. Um, survey, I suppose, uh, being a, quite a broad term now from its origin and, and what it is now. But let's go back to the, the sort of the beginning. What, what is the, the mission of, of the survey of English usage? Um, <clears throat> well, you asked that question in the present tense, but let's maybe rewind a little bit to when it was first founded by a quirk in yeah. 1959, originally in Durham. He then uh, moved uh, the survey to uh, UCL, um, where it was established. Um, he, he would call it the, the Survey of English Usage, by the way. So that's oh. like a, an old-fashioned way of uh, 
pronouncing it. And I had a quick look at the pronouncing dictionary the other day to see how many people uh, still use the old-fashioned way of pronouncing it. And John Wells has a nice pronouncing dictionary. It's about 60-40, so m most people say usage now. Lee. He would definitely have said usage. Um, ah, <laughs> yeah, and, and he moved it over to UCL then, and the and the aim of the survey was to study uh, the usage or usage of educated British English speakers, and specifically their grammar. He was mostly interested in grammar, um, especially, of course, also spoken language. And he was a real pioneer in uh, recognizing the value of spoken English, and one of the first people to actually collect spoken language because. He'd been inspired by what had happened in the U.S. There was the Brown Corpus, of course, of the early 60s, um, which, which was well on the way when he was visiting uh, the U.S. And he thought, well, I could do that for British English, but I'll add in spoken language because that's so so important. I and mean, mo most, most English that we produce is, of course, in spoken form. Um, so that was a real innovation. Now, in recent years, the, 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 the shift has been a shift in, in the interests of the survey. So there's still that interest in, in grammar, and, and I, I, as it were, embody that because I'm still in, uh, principally interested in English grammar and syntax. But we're also interested in corpus exploration and statistics. So my colleague, uh, Sean Wallace, is a, a computer scientist who's worked on corpus exploration and has recently published a book on statistics. Um, we're also interested in uh, exploring the pragmatics of English usage in, in the pragmatic domain, and we've made a recent appointment uh, in that field, Beth Mannery, and another recent appointment in World Englishes. So we're moving into that field a little bit as well. Um, Dr. Gian Wilson recently joined us uh, as a World English specialist. So, um, and, and then finally, of course, we we also look at educational linguistics. So how can we use corpora to uh, teach language and also grammar, uh, because grammar is now part of the curriculum in the UK, in the national curriculum. So the, the, the remit has, I suppose, expanded somewhat over time, and yes. we will we will get on to talking about the, the sort of present day activities, as you mentioned, there are an awful lot going on at the survey um, now. Um, going back to sort of the early days, I suppose my interest, you know, you mentioned spoken English and corpus building, and, and um, I'm very curious to sort of hear more about the original survey corpus, which I believe sort of became known as the London Lund corpus uh, at, at some point. Um, the the survey is is built at, at several corpora of English, but starting in the you know the the late fifties or sixties, presumably that process is very different uh, now compared to how it was then. So when we talk about you know they built a corpus at the beginning, the early days of the survey, um, what did that actually mean in practice? Well, let me first correct something. Um, the the first corpus, the corpus that Quirk built wasn't called the London Lund Corpus. That was cruel. We call it the Quirk Corpus or the right. Survey Corpus. It was only later when um, there was a collaboration with Lund that the spoken part of the Quirk Corpus became known as the London Lund Corpus. Ah, so yes. Okay, yeah. The LLC yeah. Uh, is the spoken part of yeah. the Corpus. And now uh, we may have time to talk about that later. There's an LLC2, very exciting uh, development. Um, well, Corpus Collection in those days was just a world away from what it is now. I mean, there were no computers. And so everything was uh, collected by hand. Recordings were made on huge recording uh, reel-to-reel -reel machines, um, and the written material was extracted from all kinds of places, but had to be all retyped on a clunky old typewriter. Um, everything was collected on, on what we now call slips. These are sort of uh, pieces of paper, the size, half the size of, I always forget the A, it's A6, I think. And here's one I folded it earlier. So it's, ah. it's, it's this size. And the entire corpus was typed onto those slips. And then a whole battery of researchers would sit in the survey research room and underline, for example, all the nouns and all the adjectives and all the noun phrases, adjective phrases and verb groups and you name it, it was all there. It was a, a hellish and immense job. Um, and that was only what we called the first phase, the first stage rather. And there was a second stage, which was 
to also collect all the direct objects and subjects and object complements and so forth. But so huge was the task of collecting those categorical data that the second stage was never really even started. Um, so it was absolutely massive undertaking. And when I tell our students who take our corpus linguistics course on our MA in English linguistics now about how these things were done, you can just see their amazement, the amazement in their eyes. I show them a picture of a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder and they don't even really know what that is or how that was done. And so there are still huge challenges um, with collecting spoken uh, material. You know, you know about this more better than, than I do. It's still hugely expensive and difficult. But in those days, it was even harder um, because you had these huge tape recorders. You couldn't you could take a little tape recording device and take it to the pub and stick it in amongst a number of friends and do a recording of a, a spontaneous conversation. That wasn't, wasn't possible. In fact, most 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 recordings now, of course, have to be with full permissions and ethical approvals and all that. In those days, uh, Quirk was far less uh, scrupulous about these things. He would secretly record people. So there are recordings in the survey corpus which have been secretly recorded without people's permissions or permission afterwards, but um, even that's not allowed these days, um, which does make for interesting materials. Um, but of course, you, you can't do that kind of thing anymore. He also collected, incidentally, interesting written materials, such as uh, love letters and diaries. Some of, oh. some of this stuff is hugely personal material. And you think, oh, why would anyone want to part with their love letters? But they somehow somehow quit, uh, persuaded them to do that. You, you know, I mean, you're, you're right, absolutely. When when it came to building the the new version of the, the spoken British national corpus, um, we obviously couldn't uh, record people secretly, nor did we especially want to. Um, but nonetheless, what what I found amazing was that all of the speakers in the corpus, they, they gave their consent, they knew they were being recorded, the recorder was you know sitting on, on the table there with them or wherever they were, and yet they still would end up in certain cases getting into some quite personal stuff uh, despite you know knowing that they were being recorded, so I could only imagine when they are actually being recorded secretly, as they were, the sorts of things that people might say to each other. It's uh, yeah, it's incredible, really. Um, you, you mentioned that Quirk was was uh, inspired, I suppose, by the you know the early American work on the the, the Brown uh, corpus, um, and sort of wanted to to sort of try and you know bring that bring that sort of effort over into the British context. Do you, do you suspect or do you, do you know that, that in the early days was, was Quirk and, and his team at the beginning of the survey met with any sort of resistance or, you know, why would you want to do that? You know, this, the, the sort of idea that studying a corpus might be uh, a, a sort of reduced sort of way of looking at language or was it more that there was, you know, a sense of enthusiasm and excitement about doing something in a bit of a different way? I, th I think that resistance wasn't so much in the UK. Well, there was resistance in the US, of course. I think there's a story of Nelson Francis or Kuchira, I forget who it was, uh, talking to uh, Robert Lees, who was a theoretician, uh, a Chomsky linguist in the US, and talking about corporate and Kuchira or Francis was saying to Lees, you know, uh, or at least was asking, what are you doing? As one does at a conference, what, what, what are you currently working on? And, and they answered, well, we're building a corpus of English. And Lee said, why on earth would you want to do that? What's the point of that? As theoreticians often did, uh, in certainly in those days, sort of the late 50s, early 60s, but went on saying for many decades after that, um, you know, what, what's the point of collecting a corpus? We can, we can just use introspection, sure, and you don't need all that stuff. Um, whereas I think one of the great insights of corpus linguistics, of course, is that introspection often isn't enough. I mean, simply the really interesting data come from corpora. Um, and those linguists, the theoret theoreticians now realize that as well. And more and more, they realize that uh, corpora are not just performance, as they used to call it, but but can give an insight also into competence in, in real insights into how language works. Um, so I don't think, to, to get back to your question, because drifting away a little bit. Um, I don't think Quirk, I, <laughs> I don't think Quirk had a uh, huge resistance in the UK and, you know, got some funding certainly from UCL 
and space at UCL. It was supported at UCL. And there was also support a bit later on from the publishing house Longman, um, with which he had uh, good ties. They 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 paid for for um, some of the work being done with the survey, and he got some funding in those days as well from uh, uh, the ESRC or Forerunners there yeah. all to 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 work on this. So the the original survey corpus, the the spoken component, and of course the written component. Um, how long did it take to build, and how big was it? Is it is it a million words or? Yes. So by yeah. today's standards, very small. Um, but as Jeff Leach used to love to say, uh, "Small is beautiful." Uh, we can come back to that because our, our, our corporate are fully tagged and parsed, so you can find grammatical structures in them in a way that you can't with a lot of the mega corpora of today. Um, I've lost my train now. What was the question? <laughs> how uh, how long did it take to oh, build really? those well, corpus? It took a huge amount of time. In fact, in, in the early 80s, when uh, Quirk became the vice chancellor of the University of London and Sidney Greenbaum took over, the corpus hadn't quite been finished. And there, was, uh, there were a few... A few thousand words missing or so um and i think greenbaum decided to fill that up with a category called handwritten notices um, <laughs> so he needed a few thousand uh, words of handwritten notices uh, to be added to the corporate uh, so that's how it was completed and certainly the analysis was was never really completed because because of the the huge undertaking that it represented so all that hand hand analysis it's just endless and it went to a huge level of detail. Um, I, I, I was involved in some of the annotation myself when I was a PhD student as a research assistant. And there was a huge manual. And of course, especially when you came across certain sentences in the spoken language, how the hell do, do you analyze this sentence which has false starts or might have a pattern that isn't really grammatical? And you had to give it some kind of analysis and file that away. So that's one of the challenges of doing parsing. So the Quirk Corpus was eventually completed in terms of the material collected, but it wasn't fully analyzed, and certainly not at the two stages that I mentioned earlier. So we, we moved through into the 80s. You, you mentioned that Sidney Greenbaum came in. You mentioned, of course, Jeff Leach. Um, and there was uh, Jan Svartvik as well. And, and collectively, they were known as the, the Gang of Four, I believe. Yeah. Um, yeah. And in 1985... Uh, they published a comprehensive grammar of the English language, um, which has sort of become known as, you know, the Quirk grammar, Quirk et al. grammar. Um, and, you know, this is something that, you know, decades later when I started studying at university was still being, you know, discussed as as being such a, a milestone moment in in the production of, um, it, of, of grammars, essentially. So, well, you know... At, what was the impact really from from your perspective of of this obviously it was corpus informed which i suppose was somewhat of an innovation at the time yeah. um relative to what we see today where where it's very much the, the sort of default approach to this sort of thing yeah i think uh, corpus informed is exactly the right way to put it i wouldn't call it corpus based because um, i was a systematic attempt to have every example be an original example um, so um, I think they did use corpora to look for particular structures and so forth. But if you look at the grammar today, you won't see, for example, uh, the, the corpus tags after yeah. each example so that you could go and find it yourself or go and listen to it yourself. <clears throat> so it was definitely corpus informed and, and possibly one of the first grammars to, to, uh, to be or to use corpora in that way. Um, and it developed into one of the um, standard reference grammars of English. Um, it's not... Not, not something you do in a couple of months, uh, write a huge grammar like that. There is a rival now, of course, which is the Cambridge grammar of the English language, which also uses authentic data to some extent. Uh, they don't make a big song and dance of it. Um, but um, certainly the Quirkadal grammar was was one of the first grammars that took corpora seriously as a way of uh, describing the language reliably uh, in terms of what people actually do and say. And so, yeah, absolutely. I think I think you're you're right there, and and the fact that that has sort of become a bit of a uh, a, a model, if you will, of of grammars that would that would come come a bit later on. And and as we sort of 
move towards uh, closer to the present, um, and and you obviously uh, came in and, and into the survey uh, as you mentioned. Um, before we talk about the sort of current activities of of what's going on today with the survey, what would you say? I suppose more broadly, um, you know, we've got decades and decades of of inquiry into how English works. I suppose. What would you say? You know, looking back over that time were some of the biggest contributions to our understanding of, of what English, you know, how English works as, as a language. I suppose bringing in spoken language is one of the really important things that uh, the survey contributed to the study of corpus linguistics um, because it was never really considered all that important. Everything, all, all grammar writing was, was based on uh, written examples, sometimes going back to the likes of Chaucer and Shakespeare, um, certainly grammarians like Jespersen and Dutch grammarian Kreisenkau were like that. They collected huge amounts of data, um, but not not much looking at the spoken language. Not not without reason, because there wasn't much of it around. There weren't many recordings or any recordings for some of these grammarians. Um, corpus exploration is another area where I think the survey has make huge inroads. So our corpora are small, like we discussed earlier on, but they are fully tagged and parsed and corrected by linguists as well. So if you're looking at grammatical patterns, if you're looking to study, say, the structure of the English noun phrase, right? Uh, hugely complex, actually, noun phrases in English. Um, you would have tens of thousands of examples uh, from a corpus uh, in seconds. So you, 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 can, you can type in using our exploration software noun phrase, find me all the noun phrases in the corpus. Less than a second, they're all there. Now, in the old days, uh, again, as I tell my students on a corpus linguistics course, if you were interested in noun phrases, you would first be confronted by filing cabinets full of them. And then, of course, you can't be interested in every aspect of the noun phrase. So let's say you're interested in relative clauses. You would have to go through all those tens of thousands of noun phrases by hand and then find the ones that had relative clauses in them, and then copy those over into your own corpus, either with a typewriter or by hand again. Um, and now, of course, that is much, much easier. And so uh, I think corpus exploration in that way um, in, in, is a huge advancement. And another area where I think the, the surveys made a huge contribution is statistics, corpus statistics. It's not one of my areas, and I'm a, a bit of a nincompoop in that domain, but uh, <laughs> like, like Sean Wallace is... Um, I, I mentioned earlier, I've written a, a book about uh, statistics and corpus linguistics. So that's another area where um, advances have been made, I think. I have that book behind me somewhere on my shelf. I yeah. promise that it's there. <laughs> um, brilliant. So, so let's let's sort of look now at, at, at today. And you sort of mentioned there, um, Sean Wallace, for instance, who is you know current uh, member of the, the, the survey. Um, uh, we've talked about the the original survey corpus, but of course that's not the only corpus that that uh, the survey has built. Um, what do you see the 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 sort of the role of of the survey? You know, today I suppose you you've mentioned that um, alongside the research, you're also doing you know teaching and and workshops and summer schools and things like that. Is it is it a bit more sort of uh, an outward facing kind of operation now in terms of disseminating the the tools and the methods to to other people too yes i think so um the other corpora um apart from the survey corps are the sgb corpus the international corpus of english which is uh, part of a wider uh, project on international corpus of english and then there is the dcbse corpus diachronic corpus of present day spoken english which allows us to track changes in spoken language over a relatively short period of time, inspired by work uh, done by uh, Jeff Leach and Christian Meyer, Marianne Hunt uh, and uh, Nick Smith, amongst others. Um, so um, the other area uh, that you mentioned is educational linguistics. Um, so we um, have used our corpus data to help teachers teach grammar in um, UK or rather English primary schools where grammar has come back in the national curriculum has done for the last 10 years or so uh, teachers find it really hard to teach grammar because they don't get much support in their teacher training courses they get 
a day of grammar, but they have to deliver an entire curriculum over a number of years in primary school. Um, and to help them with that, we set up a platform called Englishes, which has lots of language resources on it, lots of exercise materials, lesson plans, videos, and so forth. And a lot of those materials come from our corpora. Um, <clears throat> we had to be a little bit careful, of course, that um, you know the, the material that you use is age appropriate and doesn't have any upsetting materials in it and the like. Um, <clears throat> but for example, one one example of how you can use a corpus on a platform like that is that if you have an exercise in, uh, for example, uh, nouns or what are called expanded longer noun phrases in the national curriculum, you can source the um, the examples in an exercise live over the internet from a corpus. So one huge disadvantage of having a printed book with exercises is mm -hmm. each time you look at the exercise, it's the same because it's printed. Yeah, limited amount of space, so you can't use many examples. But with a corpus, you can use as many examples as you like. You can refresh them all the time, and uh, kids can do the exercise more than once with new examples coming in from uh, the corpus each time. So we've used the corpus in that way to to help teachers uh, teach grammar, um, and that's been quite successful. We also teach courses to teachers have to teach grammar in schools. Would you would you say that, you know, aside from perhaps the lack of training that that teachers are are provided in grammar, is there a a bit of a fear? You know, sometimes grammar is, you know, I, I, I'm of the, the generation where there was the sort of gap where grammar wasn't really taught. And so yeah. studying English language at at, at, at at school, in high school and at, at A level. Grammar was sort of almost like, oh, we don't we don't talk about that bit. It's the scary bit, and it's the you know we'll, we'll talk about everything else. Is there that sort of sense of a, is there a fear of of grammar um, that you're sort of trying to help teachers overcome? Yes, definitely among certain teachers, and they're not to blame for that. I mean, grammar went out of the curriculum in the '60s when it was thought that kids need to learn how to express themselves, which of course yeah. is hugely important, and all that grammar is just a distraction. Um, it's only a dis distraction if you teach it badly, um, oh. if you teach it in an unengaging way. But with what's available now on the internet and, and the resource like Englishes, it, it's actually fun to learn about grammar. Um, and m much more, you can teach it much more engagingly than was the case. And so well, there's a political angle to the whole debate about grammar in, in primary schools. And, and this is that it was brought in, of course, by a conservative government. Mm. Uh, minister who's still around these days, Michael Goh, um, who lots of people thought had a, an agenda of checking on the teachers and checking on the schools and bringing rigor into the curriculum, that kind of thing. Um, um, but I, I, I think having grammar in schools is a good idea. All over Europe, grammar is taught in schools. Um, and you know, Britain is a bit of an exception in that regard. It's a good thing to know a little, little bit about your language that you use all the time. Um, so I, I think it was a good idea, but this curriculum was just thrown into schools and, and teachers were told, here it is, go and teach it without much support from the government. And of course, it doesn't work that way. And um, there is a fear amongst uh, quite a few teachers. How do I do this? I mean, I've, I've never heard of an adverbial or a determinate determiner. Um, and so there was... There was, and, and, and to some extent still is, quite a bit of resistance. But the idea of bringing it in and then having the grammar go through all the key stages from primary into secondary um, actually saves teachers a huge amount of time, if, you know, if you don't have to keep on explaining. You know, that word that talks about people and places or the word that describes another word, if you can use the meta-language adjective or noun, mm -hmm. that is so much easier. And actually, there are some evidence that kids really like doing grammar. Um, it's the teachers are often more afraid of it. Um, I, this is what I hear from teachers that I teach on our course, English Grammar for Teachers. They often say that, that they're surprised to see the kids like it quite a bit, but they are a little bit fearful of it. Um, but the fear, I mean, once you explain some of the basics of grammar, the fear kind of goes away because they realize, actually, it can be good fun to teach, but... Um, it's just the way it was brought in that wasn't very 
wasn't very helpful. Of course, there are the tests as well. So um, there's a year two test, age six, and that's optional now, but there's another test in year six. Um, which, did I see? Yeah, year two test, which is optional, and the year six test, which is part of the SATs. Um, and there's been some resistance against that too. So would you say in terms of how the the corpora that you use to inform the the training uh, in the, the course you mentioned, English Grammar for Teachers, are we talking about simply um, using insights from the corpus to provide some examples, to demonstrate the points that you're making about gram grammatical structures, et cetera, or is it more sort of data-driven learning? Is it actually encouraging teachers to search through the corpora themselves or even to have their their students looking through through corpus data? Where, where do you sort where does it sort of sit on that that client, if you will? Well, there are two levels. Um, I, I always tell teachers about the importance of recognizing that different people use language in different ways, also in different regions. So not to stigmatize kids that don't use standard English, mm -hmm. to learn standard English. That's a concept that's a little bit under discussion these days, but I, I think it makes sense to have a, a particular model, let's call it general English to teach. Um, but it's important that teachers are aware that you can also um, use language differently if you're from a different area. And that, that it's fine to do that um, in your own personal settings, but you have to be aware of the standard language as well. And so I mean, use examples to um, to make that clear. So for example, I've recently been interested in a construction where um, speakers replace the past participle by a past tense form. And they might say something like, I've broke my glasses or something like that. And I have broken my glasses. Very widespread in the UK. Um, and I demonstrated by, um, I have a slide of, a, of two speakers from uh, the TV program Gogglebox. They're both oh. Yeah, one of my favorite shows. Um, it's great. Yeah. <laughs> those two those two speakers are from Hull, where it's quite uh, quite quite a common feature of uh, northeastern English. Um, so I demonstrate that aspect to them uh, of the importance of stressing that there's so much diversity out there, um, and 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 that's useful uh, to make clear also to pupils. Now we have also built a little bit of uh, corpus work or corpus exploration into the uh, English's platform. Uh, it, that would mostly be something that teachers in secondary would use, or maybe even A level, to do some um, exploration with corpora. So, for example, we have a um, an exploratory, exploratory unit about the use of tag questions and whether women use those more than men. There's been a lot of research on that, as you, as you know. Um, and um, of course, corpora are perfect to, um, to look at that kind of thing. So we take teachers and students through a way in which they can use a corpus to uh, explore that question. So, so yeah, that's, that's another way in which corpora can be used in education. Uh, uh, absolutely. And, and you know, I know these courses have been running for, for some years now, so um, you, I'm sure you'll have received lots of, of really, you know, uh, good feedback from, from the teachers in terms of how, how useful it is for them. Yeah, I mean, for me, the really nice thing to see at the end of a course, because you, what you do get, we also teach this as an inset course, is you do see in the morning when you start, you see some faces thinking, oh my God, I've got to <laughs> on this course for three yeah. and a half hours of grammar. Please help me. We did yeah. an inset course in a school on the 3rd of January, my colleague Luke Pierce and myself. Uh, and, and you can see from some of the body language, I don't want to do this. Um, but what's really gratifying is to, as you go through the morning and you, you, you show how uh, uh, certain aspects of grammar are useful for pupils and for teachers, you can see their faces brighten up. So, for example, there's the uh, the fronted adverbial, which is discussed so much in in the media uh, um, as, as a big bugbear. You know, what on earth is the fronted adverbial? You get in tweets. I went to Oxford, and I was never taught what the fronted adverbial. Yeah. <laughs> in other words, like you know, if it was, you know everything, so you don't. Mm, yeah. Know the no curiosity about the fronted adverbial, but of course the. the the point about a fronted adverbial is that it brings some variety in the writing. So rather than have, say, a time specification or a reason specification at the end, 
I saw my friends last night. You can put it at the beginning last night, I saw my friends, and that brings some variety in writing, which six, seven-year-olds, they don't know about, right? So yeah. they, their sentences are usually all the same. Um, and so that was the reason it was brought in. And also the, the concept of the expanded now phrase, which is simply a now phrase which has more than two words in it. Kids write about the dog, the cat, the holiday, or the teacher, and then they're taught. Well, maybe you could add a word that makes that now phrase a little, little bit less boring. That's how teachers oh. have been to lots of primary classrooms, and that's how they learn to uh, make their writing uh, more developed, and more mature. So there's yeah. a really good reason to have those concepts in the curriculum. It's it's interesting what what you just said there about you know make it less boring. Um, okay. This is a bit of an anecdote, but I'll go for it anyway. Um, this is leveling up is a term that, of course, has become very well known for, you know, the the, the conservative government's sort of uh, campaign agenda for what they want to do with the country. But I came across this phrase leveling up before they started using it in that context. And it was in uh, primary schools. Um, I was working at the University of Leeds a few years ago, and uh, I was interviewing um, primary school students about um, about language and 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 about how they, you know, um, it was about the transition actually, the transition from primary to secondary. And they were talking, they were telling me about how they would be told to level up an adjective, for instance, by replacing "nice" to level it up with something um, rarer, I suppose. To make it less boring, but that that was the the phrase that came back over and over again. Level up your words, um, and then suddenly the government are using it to talk about you know uh, trying to, supposedly trying to improve the country. And I, I've always wondered whether it came from there or not. But um, I'm not sure if that's a, a phrase you've heard your teachers using or not. No, not so much. Or perhaps if they were using it, they're not doing so much now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably. Yeah, the, um, tra the transition. Sorry, the transition primary secondary is interesting because one 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 nice thing about the curriculum is that it, it goes through all those key stages. It's sometimes a little bit disheartening that there are teachers in secondary uh, who, who tell their year seven kids that come in, forget about all that grammar that you learned in primary. We're going to do it all differently. That's a great shame, and they don't seem to realise that actually the fact that these kids come into their year seven with all that knowledge is hugely helpful to them. So. Um, setting aside all the politics, there are huge benefits to that. Yeah, a a absolutely, absolutely. And and I want to I want to ask you about another of the the courses that you and your colleagues run at the Survey of English Usage, which is your uh, summer school in yeah. English Corpus Linguistics, um, which I believe uh, was obviously moved online during COVID, um, uh, and it's coming up again. Uh, this year, um, who who's this for, and 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 you know how where where did the sort of the the idea come to 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 set up this this summer school? Um, the summer school is mostly for uh, university students with uh, some knowledge of uh, linguistics already. So it's it's not a course that's aimed at the general public. Mm -hmm. um, it has quite a bit of. Um, practical material in it, sort of hands-on ways of using uh, our software IceCup, the corpus exploration software that was uh, designed by uh, by Sean, um, and using that in and, and using that in the students' own projects that they might have or might be engaged in doing for their own universities. Um, and it was on it was face to face and then we did indeed move online. It will be online again this year. But we're thinking of alternating it, so some meet one year online and then face to face. So some people prefer online and others prefer face to face. It it really is a matter of uh, preference. Obviously, um, you know if you if you have to come to London, uh, there are huge costs in travel and accommodation if you if it if it's face to face. So those are all kinds of things that we're talking about all the time. Um, <clears throat> it is evolving a little bit the the course. So with our new uh, colleagues uh, Beth Mannery and, and Gian Wilson, we are now bringing in some components of work that they're interested in and they've used Corpora for. So um, it is an evolving course um, and we, we monitor also ask our students, well, what is it you want to learn about? It's also got a, uh, 
a statistics component, as you might expect, because uh, Sean is also teaching on it. So that's that's also a strong element of that course to uh, help students um, with their statistics. Well, uh, best of luck with the the next run of of the course uh, this summer. Um, we're going to start to uh, wrap things up here uh, with with our with our episode of Corpus Cast, and um, I like to to end by asking a, a set of three quick questions um, mm -hmm. to to my guests. So here we go. Are you ready? Yeah. <laughs> here we go with the first one. Um, what is the the biggest change you've noticed in Corpus research throughout your career? Well, it's got to be data explosion, hasn't it? I mean, uh, the corpora that we discussed in the survey of English usage were uh, and are, by today's standards, very small. And they have their advantages. We talked about that as well. You know, you, reliability is one of the huge advantages of them. Um, but with with mega corpora now being fourteen, fifteen billion words, um, you could you can find things that were hard to find that are hard to find in, in smaller corpora. Um, I've, I've been doing some research recently in uh, participles that modify nouns, so things like the ticking clock or the, the working colleague or something like that. Um, and there aren't that many of them, and you need big corpora to find them. Um, so big corpora are immensely useful in that regard. So data explosion is the big development. It brings challenges with it as well, like um, like, I, like I just mentioned reliability. So we've got all those data. How reliable are they? So if we look at, say, uh, the corpora that Mark Davis has collected on EnglishCorpora.org, they're absolutely amazing. They've got a word class tagging to them as well, but of course, none of that, none of that you can check. I mean, um, it, it's, it's, it's uh, automatically tagged <clears throat> and very uh, useful. But the question of reliability is something that comes into these mega corpora. So it has its challenges, but of course it has been immensely useful as well. Okay. Question two. What is the biggest misconception of corpus linguistics that you've encountered? I found that a hard question. What's the biggest <laughs> misconception? Um, um, I, th I think some people regard corpus linguistics still as um, as a branch of linguistics, which to my mind it isn't, um, as other people have pointed out, it's it's, it's more of a methodology. Yeah. Um, there used to be a misconception, which has gone out of the window, Luck gladly, uh, I say uh, luckily, because, um, and that used to be the, the misconception that number crunching was all you needed to do. So I mm -hmm. remember, attended many a paper at conferences where somebody would say compare the use of tag questions in Australian English with American English and the conclusion would be well they use them more often in American English than Australian English and that would be the end of the paper right you'd sit there saying well yeah so what I mean we don't yeah. know why that is no. and that that kind of presentation at, at conferences seems to have disappeared which I think is a really good thing that used to be a misconception um and the misconception that theorists have, mm. to some extent, still have. There are still diehard theoreticians who reject corpus data. Um, but that, too, seems to be uh, disappearing, uh, which is a good thing, again, that uh, corpora are recognized for for what they are what they're for and what they're useful for. I, I think you've, you've just given me um, an idea to introduce a, a, a new question, which is, uh, what side of the fence do you sit on? Is corpus linguistics a theory or a method? Is it you know is it a discipline or is it a set of tools to do other things? But that's really interesting. Um, I want to ask the, the the third question though, which is how will corpus linguistics uh, make an impact on the world in the future, or perhaps continue to make an impact? Yeah, I think the data explosion will continue. And we'll have more and more sophisticated tools in exploring corpora. Also, uh, multimodal corpora. My, my colleague Jan Wilson is very interested in multimodal corpora. That's always been a challenge, you know, annotating uh, gestures or um, that kind of thing. You know, having you know, video images as well. But I think um, um, some of the areas you mentioned uh, at 
the top of our meeting, uh, for example, in social sciences, uh, in medical humanities, for example, um, you know, it has been done to some extent, but for example, building a corpus of uh, the use of language by patients who have dementia, for example, and I think you can, uh, you know, for diagnostic purposes, for example, um, that brings, again, huge challenges with it. it medical humanities are a fascinating area which is exploding as well but if you have such a corpus say of the the use of language by dementia patients you would have to somehow annotate that somehow you need to pick out some of the features that these patients use uh, maybe use increasingly over time uh, if you want to use it as a diagnostic tool but that kind of annotation is a hugely time consuming and therefore very expensive to implement so those are also the challenges that come with that and funding is harder to get these days for building corporate building resources like that the funders you know funding is is hard to get anyway but um for that kind of thing it's perhaps even harder so you know there are huge advantages also in educational linguistics all kinds of areas where corporate are becoming uh, uh more uh used more so there's plenty more work to be done. We're, we're not out of a job yet. <laughs> well, thank you, uh, Baz, so much for, for, for coming on today. It's been so great to hear about, you know, the history of the Survey of English Usage, of course, but also some of the ways in which you and your team are applying uh, the, 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 the knowledge from that history to, you know, reaching out and, and, and training teachers and educational linguistics. It's, it's really, it's really great to hear all about this. Um, I want to ask you just before we finish, um, because I, I, I realize that you, you don't necessarily have your own Twitter profile with your name on, but you are active on Twitter. Um, tell us where we can find you uh, online. Um, well, we have two Twitter feeds. One is for the survey of English usage. Um, I think that's called. I don't even know what the handle is. <laughs> We've got it. We've <laughs> you can call them, uh, the yeah, 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 yeah. Another is the uh, Englishus uh, platform as well. So we, we we're active on both those platforms. Both and both. I I I believe you also have a, a blog, Grammarianism. Yeah, is that right? yeah, yeah. I don't contribute as much to it as I would like. Uh, when I started it, I was full of enthusiasm. I still am, but I'm finding it's very uh, time consuming to to put together. Uh, a blog, but uh, I do contribute to it in a trickle-down fashion, as it were. That's called grammarianism, um, and it's on the Word, WordPress platform. Great, and there, as you can see on the screen now, we we found your uh, your both of your your Twitter profiles. So thank you to uh, our producer Sam for for finding those and putting them up on the screen. Um, okay, well, well, thanks once again, and of course, thank you to you, our viewers and listeners of uh, Corpus Cast, thanks for joining us. However you have accessed us, whether that's on YouTube, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and all the other platforms that we're on, why not subscribe and chuck us the uh, good old five-star rating while you're at it, if you think we deserve it. Um, and of course, do let us know your thoughts about this and other episodes uh, using the hashtag Corpus Cast, and make sure to check out the Aston Corpus Linguistics Research Group on Twitter, at Aston Corpus. It and you can follow me at Lovermob. Uh, Corpus Cast is an Aston Originals podcast written and hosted by me, Robbie Love, and produced by Sam Cook. So thanks again for listening, and thanks to our guest, Baz Arts, for appearing on Corpus Cast. It's been a pleasure to speak to you. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me.